this event. But when I tell you today is such a power packed event, it's a day of the women leading leading this this uh, call because we have a woman female moderator who's a PhD. We have the speakers who are PhDs, and all of them, including your moderator, they received their EB one. So Dr. Naam Panza Dodu, she's an associate professor who um, very recently got her tenure from uh, the a top liberal arts college in the East Coast, uh, that is Emerson uh, College. And uh, she's a dear friend of mine, and she is going to be the one who is going to moderate our session and drive this forward. So with that, uh, Dr. Dodu, over to you. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are so excited to have you for this session. Um, I'm really excited about the panelists as well, because I think, as Aditi said, it would be great to hear from these powerful women who were able to get approval for their EB ones. Um, so I am so sorry because I'm I'm sure I'm gonna say the names wrong. So please forgive me. Um, but we have Dr. Arya Ashok um and Dr. Kamal Shukla. Um so Dr. Arya is a senior medical science liaison and Dr. Kamal is an air quality scientist. So what we're gonna be talking about today is they are gonna be sharing their journeys um, on how they are EB1. They're gonna be talking a little bit about the average timeline that they took to prepare their profile. They're gonna be talking a little bit about the strategies they use to kind of align their PhD work with their the criteria that is usually um, um, asked for EB1. And then you're also going to be talking a little bit about how they were able to navigate sponsorship from employers and any US CIS um, rejections or anything of that sort. So um, for this session, we will have about 20 minutes per person for them to talk about their journey. And then we'll have about 20 minutes for you to ask any questions um, that you may have um, for our panelists. So that's how we're going to um, divide this session. So at the 20 minute mark, I'll come back on and then I'll moderate the question Q and A session as well. Um, but I think we are good to just jump in. Um, so Dr. Aya or Dr. Kamal, whoever wants to go first, we can um, start with either of you. I'm fine with either. I can I can go second or first. Como yo pick. I'd let Arya start. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So um is this should I just um uh, talk about my journey and then they can ask me questions, right? Okay. Perfect. Hi everyone. Um good morning here in Phoenix and good afternoon for everyone on the East Coast. So Really exciting to talk to you all today about my EB1B journey. And uh, if I have to summarize it, I would say that it's kind of like a Bollywood movie where there's a lot of drama and emotions. And in the end, it was a happy ending. So that was good. Um, so my EB1B, so luckily it started off, actually, I did not have any idea that I would even qualify um, for the EB1B. So let's start there. And then I talked to my friend who recently got her EB1A approved. And uh, she told me that, um, you know, I said, you know, I don't have enough citations. Um, can I even apply for the EB1 category? Because in my mind, when I started this journey, is that you have to be the scientist like Einstein, who has all of these awards and all of these publications. And, uh, and I just looked at myself like the small mouse in the science field that um, probably is not qualified enough to be um, to be eligible to apply. So that was my first, um, really my first conversation with my friend. She told me that, hey, you know what? You don't need to apply for EB1A. You could apply for EB1B, um, which is an option for you based on the citation profile that I have. So I was excited because it gave me hope that I can um, go through that EB1B path. So then the next thing was for me to talk to my employer and have them convinced that they need to sponsor my EB1B application. So that was, again, very interesting because, as you all know, employers are not very knowledgeable about immigration. They don't know a lot about green cards and all the paths. But luckily, I had a very strong relationship 
um, with the leadership in my company. And I was able to convince them to not use the lawyers that they had in the company and use the lawyers that I wanted. And I had to write documents about why I think that the lawyers, because the lawyers in the company, they're not specialized to do an EB-1B application, right? They they do H-1Bs, um, you know, they do the EB-2 perm, but they're not specialized to do the EB-1B. So I did not feel like that was the right path for me. So I, I was able to convince my employer to go with the lawyers that I wanted, which I was really lucky um, to have that. And then the next was um, I did in terms of which lawyers I finally ended up going was Victoria Chen. So I ended up um, kind of doing a contract with them. I mean, my company did. And then uh, we started my EB1B application. So the whole time, my first application I submitted in um, December of 2022. And it took me about nine months to get all the letters of recommendation, build up my profile, things like that. And um, unfortunately, I went in not doing all the things that you all did here, right? So I was, unfortunately, my lawyer said, oh, yeah, you have a good profile. And, you know, everyone said Victoria Chen is really good. So I trusted them. And I did not, you know, in, I did not put a lot of effort into my application. And I kind of just went with whatever the lawyers told me to do. And they said the they drafted the letters. I said, it's good. Um, they did my application. I said, it's good. I, I just, I just trusted everything the lawyers did. I did not put any effort from my end to make it better or anything like that. So then I submit my application in December. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go on a holiday. I went to Hawaii for two weeks. I was like, I'm going to have fun. And then, you know, I'm going to hear the good news. And then I submit it and then I go on vacation. And then I hear the news that um, I got an NOID for my application. It was um, a notice of intent to deny. So as soon as I got the NOID, I was really upset. I was looking up online and I realized that NOID is usually a high chance of denial. And based on the comments that I got back from uh, the officer, it was really, it was really bad. Everything the officer mentioned in all the comments were, you know, it it was really bad. Like it was, he completely um, tore apart my entire application. And after reading the comments, I was pretty, um, pretty, pretty sad. But uh, my lawyers actually recommended that um, this officer has a really very low approval rate And they did not recommend um, doing, you know, like giving a response because they feel like the chances of this this specific uh, officer approving my profile would be very low because they had a different citation threshold. So, uh, again, just to give everyone context, my citation threshold was about 95 was uh, my citation was 95 in the December in the December application and uh, my profile was that um, I'm working as a senior medical science liaison at uh, Tempest Labs. I was I had two clinical trials where my research contributed to that clinical trial. Um, my research contributed to the drug being on clinical trials, um, and those were two separate drugs in two separate clinical trials. And then I have um, peer reviewed about fifteen peer reviews, and. Um, trying to think. And then I did have uh, peer reviews. Yeah. So those were the things that I did. And yeah, so then the decision was made that we would not go forward and do the, we would not do a response and we would just withdraw my application because that's what the lawyers recommended. And just based on the offer. So they felt it was a waste of time to do that. So we withdrew the application and that's when I actually kind of woke up from my little bubble and I told myself, Arya, you need to put in some effort into this application. You can just rely on the lawyers. And that was the biggest learning uh, learning lesson for me that you cannot rely on the lawyers to do your entire application. You need to um, you need to put in the effort to build your prof- uh, to build your profile. So that's when I had the big realization that, hey, lawyers are just gonna build your profile based on the evidence you have they are not going to help you build your profile. I had no I, I this was a big learning for me. So this is this is this is huge because I think it's important for us to understand that lawyers they are not in a position to help you build your profile. You have to build your profile yourself. 
And that's when I started going on Facebook groups, Slack groups. I found Aditi's group, which was amazing. I connected with her. She was very sympathetic about my first rejection. And she said, you know, the second time will be good. So that's when I went, you know, over all of the groups and um, I was able to kind of get a sense of what, what needs to be done in order to build up um, your EB1B profile. And that's when I started talking to people. I did a lot of networking and all of you here are doing the right things because you need the more number of people you talk to, the more number of strategies you're going to get to how to build your profile. Um, and that's when I realized I need to do, you know, more. So then I started building up my profile. So what did I do to build up my profile? Number one, I tried to, um, for everyone in the science background, you know, I tried to increase the number of peer reviews I did. So I had like 15 peer reviews in the first time I tried to do, um, when I submitted my second application, I did about 30. So I doubled the number of peer reviews I did. Um, the second thing I did was, uh, this, even, even if you do peer reviews, um, editorial, if you're part of editorial board boards, that also adds much much more value than just doing peer reviews. So then I started to get on editorial boards um, for two different manuscripts. And um, so that's another important step that I did to, you know, kind of build my profile. And then I also started, um, you know, I tried to, um, you know, kind of bring my research up in media, but that really does not you know, work very well if it's it's really hard to kind of do that route. And then you can also look at memberships as another category. Um, I did look at some memberships um, that were based on nomination and not based on, um, you know, anyone can apply. So that was another category that I looked at. So then after my December application, to give you all a timeline, I started um, working on a new profile. So I really revamped my whole profile. I got new letters of recommendation from, um, from really top, top, top scientists from across the world. I got um, letters from scientists who've used my research and they've utilized my research and they've cited my work in their papers and got letters from them. So that's the other mistake I made in my first application always get letters of recommendation from people who have cited your work. That's what I realized. Like that puts much more impact on your application than just a random person commenting on your work. So, so that's the, um, that's the feedback I got from my first application is that all of these researchers that have sent a letter of recommendation, that's just giving commentary about Dr. Ashok's work. It doesn't show impact. So my second round, I had to show impact. So that's, I really focused on showing impact, like how, so if I have to tell everyone, like really, if when you're thinking about building your profile, think about the impact that your research has made in, in that specific field of you know, research that you're in. So really try to hide, um, do the impact because what I realized from my first rejection is that, so they look at you know the first, as you all know, there's, there's two ways to look at the applicant. I mean, there's just, there's just one way how the officer looks at the application. Step one is they look at, oh, does the does this applicant uh, check all the boxes, right? At least check um, for EB1B, you have to check two out of the six criterias. So do they check those criterias? The second step in EB1B is to see if your profile is outstanding. So is the person internationally outstanding? So, and that's where majority of the applications get denied is when you're not able to show that you're up, you're an internationally outstanding applicant. And how do you do that? You do that by showing impact. You have to show the impact of your research. And of course, I had all of this I learned from my first rejection, which was a good learning experience because I got all of the comments from the officer and I worked on everything. So just to kind of give you the second timeline, um, December, 2022, I got a rejection. I revamped the whole application with new letters of recommendation. Um, editorial board memberships, and uh, again, more clinical. So I got more evidence about my clinical trial involvement and research, and I worked on it, and I submitted my application in August of 2023, and I got my approval in four days without an RFE, without any kind of, um, so I got my approval in four days. I did do premium processing, and, um, and I got my approval in, in four days, which was super exciting, and 
Um, and also to tell you that um, talking about the centers, because I think that's also a conversation that a lot of that I did think about because I was going to my application because I live in Phoenix, Arizona, it was going to go to the Nebraska location. And I know there are some um, chats out there that say that the Texas is supposed to be having a fairly better approval rates than the Nebraska, but mine went to the Nebraska center both times. So that was, uh, that was my, yeah. So I think I'll just wrap it up here because that's really my, uh, my story is I had one rejection. I had an awakening where I was like, Aria, you got to wake up and do some work and you cannot rely on lawyers and lawyers cannot help you build your profile. That's the biggest takeaway I want to give everyone here. And if you work hard on your profile, that's it's totally possible to build on your build your profile. Like you can definitely do it. I want to give everyone hope because I think hope is the number one factor that helped me uh, when I got my first rejection. So everyone out here in this group, if you're trying to build your profile, it is possible to build your profile. There are ways to build your profile. The more number of people you talk to, the more ideas you're going to get for your specific research field and for your specific situation. So I had spreadsheets of all the people that I talked to and all the things that they did and how they were successful. So have spreadsheets and you keep going back to those spreadsheets. So the more number of people you talk to, the more success you're going to have, the more success stories you hear, you're going to get more ideas. And, you know, you might be using different ideas from different people and it might be a different kind of path for you. But um, I think the ideas come from talking to people, from networking, and that's been super helpful to me. And again, when you're thinking about building a profile, think about how that impact, like that's really important. And how can you show objective evidence? Um, my lawyers also told me rely less on the letters of recommendation because that's subjective evidence. Try to provide more objective evidence like citations, papers, you know, certifications, those help uh, provide more objective evidence. But yeah, that's, I will stop there and say, this is possible. I thought it was never possible for me, but it was possible and it can be done. And I want to give everyone hope and I want to give everyone um, all the good luck for their own journey. And I'm happy to help anyone because a lot of people helped me in my journey. So um, I will stop there. Thank you so much. So I'll be trying to summarize um, each panelist's takeaways as they go through their journey. Um, so I'll be just putting it in, in the chat. But whilst I do that, thank you again for sharing your journey. We are so glad you were able to kind of get approval after the, the, the first NOID. Um, so proud of everything you were able to do. Um, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Shukla, who will share her journey. And I, again, I'll be typing in the chat and giving my takeaways from what they said. So um, over to you, Dr. Shukla. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for this session. So just hearing uh, Ari's story, I know Ari back in the day when she just got the noise and we were talking about it. But just, just in today, I realized that her journey and my journey is entirely different. It's so parabolic. Like, it just looked like LED strategically put us here so that we can both put our points. So, uh, one, I was highly networking way before even I started my ed one I remember I was in everyone's LinkedIn DMs, my Facebook DMs, talking about criteria, talking about lawyers. I, I remember I texted Adpi. Four times when I almost submitted my EB1B, I became a part of Slack community when I already, no, I got the result the very next day when I was a part of the community. So um, just just some key, key, key aways from like what Arya already told. Uh, network, be part of the communities, learn from people, learn what they put in criteria because the amount of work that you'll put in the next six or seven months in making your profile would be would be this much, say about 50 60%. But rather if you meet the some of the mentors that Aditi can direct you, Aditi herself, me, Arya, or more folks like this, they're all over Facebook. Try to know their journeys, how they went there, what they actually fit in their criteria. So that you know you, you're not going to get an RFE saying that you're just an ordinary postdoc or a PSD or, or a researcher. What's very extraordinary about it? So leverage your time by networking first, trying to get to know other people's profile. 
this would be one of the very strong key takeaways. So my journey starts long back when I got my O1, that was last year, September. Or believe it or not, when I got my O1, I before that I wouldn't even have thought about EV ones, just like Arya said. Like you don't think you, you think you're like ordinary PhD, you've done great work, but what more good? And I did O1. And to my surprise in premium processing, I got it in five days. Uh, and when I got it, I and my husband had this chat, like, you know, I should apply for EB1. And we're like, we were still very talking in low tones because, you know, what if I tell everybody and they're like, you've got 200 citations and Nebraska Center asked for five. You, you read all kinds of things on the internet. At least I read 500 citations, 1,000 citations. Lawyers don't take your case, this, that, all, all kind of myths, I would say. So I read them and I was like, I have 200 citations. This is not going to make work. And that was one mistake. Uh, and that's that's why from September, I filed my EB1 B in April last week and it got approved. And to admit my second mistake, I did not apply for EB1 A even then because I thought it might not get in there. But um, uh, last month, I think I applied for my EB1A and it was with a lot of chatter after RDB. And I was thinking like, is it trying too much? I've already got approved for O1 twice, I have EB1B. So look at the journey. It starts with like, is it even good enough? 200 citation, 175 citation. I, I can tell about 20 people from my Facebook can come up with the screenshots, me asking nice questions like, I have 175 citations. I've got only seven papers. I've got only six conferences. I've got book chapters. Is that good enough or is it just ordinary PhD? And uh, I was talking to Aditi, I guess, about two months back. And I was like, you know, I've got this big offer and my role changed and, and I'm technical right? director in this new company. Should I do EB1A? Or is it like too much, aiming too high? And she's like, go for it. And I'm like, really? Can it work? And I got approved for EB1A as well. To, so uh, another takeaway from Arya's point, not repeating much, is do not consider your profile less. Think of it. And third, third point I would say, which Arya already mentioned and I wanted to mention, if possible, I would advise do not even work with your company lawyer. I, it, this, this sounds like a strong advice to come to, but unless your company lawyer has, a, 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 if they're proficient in EB1, then only opt with them. If they are generic EB2 lawyers, you know, who, who are specifically for all uh, Chinese, Indian, and South Asian folks who just tend to get you an I-140 because of the uh, retrogress dates, EB2 lawyers are not going to work for EB1. EB1 is specialized category of visa, also called Einstein visa. Have your lawyer. There are so many law groups. Um, I, I don't want to specifically promote one of them, but you can check in communities. There's a, there's a portal with a uh, lawyer recommendation where you can read about some of the lawyers. If, you, if you're just a beginner, if you're starting your day today on EB1, read about lawyers. Most of them provide a free evaluation on your profile. So you can give them a written part of your CV. They can scan through. They can tell you like, you know, what are your chances? Uh, how good are you? When you give them your details, give them in length and depth tell about your work. Do not just say like, you know, I'm a green scientist. I'm an AI scientist, biomedical scientist. They're like dozens like us. And all of them get rejections, RFEs, and sometimes denial. Talk about your work in detail and try to explain to a lawyer what all you have done over the journey, right? If most of you have PhDs, even not if you have masters with your industry work, try to lend uh, uh, and, you know, decode every part and piece for them so that they can see through what you've done. So that's, um, that's three takeaways before you start your journey. Look for the lawyers. Do not underestimate your profile. Start early and network. Network. Network with people who know people and then talk to those people and ask all your questions. And uh, trust me, you're gonna find kinder people, nicer people who end up giving you details. Uh, I, I met people who told me, you know, I, I met people through Aditi's connection who read my EB1 petition uh, online and they were like, you know, just change this, just change this, add this, that, that. Fourth point um, before digging deep in my journey, like Arya was saying, one of her mistakes was that she initially accepted what lawyers were doing and she was like, yeah, that, that's good enough. That's how lawyers do. That's what you'll find most of the people initially doing. If you're lucky enough, you're, if your profile profile is like gigantic, you've got like 2,000 citations, paid in slime, even with normal lawyers, your work can sail through. But if if not, if you think if you're somebody like me, and I I recognize myself somebody who is, I don't know, um, who is somebody ordinary who just 
kept doing things and consistency led me here. So work with your lawyer. With my first own petition, my lawyer wrote it and I printed it and I was reading it and I sent it to my friends like sections and then we proofread it and we're like, we'll add this, this. I remember I counted 17 mistakes and I was to her like, you know, you're not counting my conference correctly. This is correct. This is not correct. You have to put appendix here and there. So entirely opposite journey. By the time I did my EB1B, my lawyer was asking me questions. And when did when we did 1A, she, she proposed me, do you want to like proofread letters, recommendation letters for us? And we'll pay you some for this. And I'm like, oh, have we reached there? Have you corrected letters as much? So your aim has to be, you have to, you have to one up your lawyer. Read everything they're doing. Take sample petitions from online. Look at how people design appendix. Appendix doesn't like, uh, you, you might know there are like six criteria in EB1B and there are eight criteria in EB1A and you have to meet two or three uh, respectively in EB1B and EB1A. Uh, one of the advices that I got from some of the successful EB1 applicants were that do not try to hit multiple criteria instead of like, you know, trying to think like there are six criteria in EB1B, there's eight in EB1A, I'm going to go five or six or four or five. Try to do like three or four for EB1B, maybe. For EB1A, try to do three and four again. For EB1A, you require three, so do for like four or five. But do those that you're very, very aware of. One of, one of my uh, friend from Slack community and um, mentor, I, I don't know, uh, who, who's, who's a faculty who got EB1A, uh, you might meet him in another session, start me the same. That, um, so when you're giving your petition, when you read your petition, when you work through your lawyer, you know that, okay, I am going to, for example, for my EB1B, I went with original contribution, author's work, uh, and judging, which are like simpler ones for PhDs. For my EB1A, I went for, I added two of them, uh, high salary and critical capacity. So uh, when you when you talk to these people, you find some important advice like um, high salary is something that gets RFE. It's not one of the easy criteria. Can raise eyes. Um, judging is one of the simpler criteria. If you've reviewed a lot of papers, if you've been in, if you have chaired the seminar, if you've been the the part of the research bodies where you're reviewing research grants, if you have, for example, reviewed uh, abstract conferences or reviewed even even any other research programs, it, it tends to be a lot easier. You get a lot lesser RFP because the proof that go into the appendix are Sure, sure. Like, like the, your your uh, person at the USCIS can read it and they know like, yeah, this is good, right? But when you go for criteria like high salary, high salary can be anything. And when you go in depth with your lawyer, you'll figure out like, you know, how to put in mathematical evidence to it. So if you're just starting, try to figure out which criteria you're really, really matching up. I, I would say if the session is being attended by some of the PhDs, at least 50%, then try to at least have authors because you, you might have papers. Try to have papers which are um, in the journals, which are at least ranked top five in your field, right? I, I came from climate tech and I had some papers in top journals. So talk about the ranking of your journal. You have to highlight your work from the strengths of it. Instead of talking, hey, I did blah, 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 this paper, this was cited by 100 people. Big deal, people cite papers 500 times. So it doesn't lead you anywhere. If you've done work, which, which has been uh, part of a big journal, which has been cited by big, big groups, which has been cited uh, in the papers, which came like in Nature, which, are, which has been cited by Howard Cambridge, use those. The more generic your petition sounds like, hey, I've got seven papers, they're published here, they've got like well, 300 citations. I know somebody with 500 citations who got an RFE on O1 along with me. And I read their petition later on, a lot of bogus content, right? You you cannot just talk about. Uh, so try to talk in ten, in sense of quality, in, in uh, other than quantity. You your people, um, and because I would say I've been on internet for one year, which was quite some long time, only talking about petition and immigration. I figured out you you might hear stuff like, oh, you gotta have five hundred citation, thousand citation. And then you still meet people who get rejections, who get noise, and it wouldn't work. And then you meet people, like just Arya mentioned, she started her journey with 100 citations, who will get approval without an RFE. Of course, with a lot of sense of work in petition, but that happens. And this will happen to you if you're very clear about your criteria and about the evidences that you're putting in your petition. Uh, also, 
one of the advices that I got, instead of working your position per perpendicularly, work, um, sorry, instead of working it horizontally, work it perpendicularly, which means that, that try to have less criteria but have more value in them. It should have depth instead of putting your evidences in five criteria. For example, um, when I did my um, EB1B, the first petition, I, I knew that I could qualify for high salary. But at that point, my lawyer thought this high salary doesn't look that high salary at this point, and it might get an RFE. And once the lawyer reaches to this, this particular criteria and says, oh, RFE, doubtful, he is going to go check all your criteria. And then this can be a game of RFEs, denial, or anything. You don't want to leave a sense of doubt. Do less, do stronger. So she said, I said, but we, we don't want to leave it. You know, this is about 5% to what the database says and this and that. And she's like, yeah, but how are we going to use it? We're going to use it and put it into the renowned author. That you've got publication. You're so known in your field that your company decided to pay you higher than everybody else. And that's how you're a renowned author because you've got papers. You say you have seven, seven papers, but we file generally with 10 papers. But how do we make those seven papers look stronger? We had salary also here. We also say that you were invited for this, 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 that. So we worked up my criteria. And I think that was one reason that during my O1, EB1B and 1A, I never got an RFE. I would say also very lucky because it's all officers, but because... You don't leave a doubt as if like, just do it as if you're checking an answer sheet. How will you check somebody's answer sheet? If somebody's writing all the formulas, this, 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 this. If it is appeasing, it's going to get, get there. If it's not appeasing, it's probably not. Uh, one of the other takeaways, apart from getting in depth of my journey, is that um, when, when you do your petition and probably Aditi can vouch for it, um, you have read it, your lawyer has read it, you've seen the appendix. When you read it, if you think this portion looks wrong, this portion looks less, this can invite RFP. He can ask like, oh, you're saying you're this top percentage of author who has done this, you've got this patent, this is an original contribution. If somebody reads it and they say like, yeah, but it's not evident, it doesn't say so. It, like you're saying it, you're saying good language about yourself. I am Dr. Shukla, I'm extraordinary scientist, blah, 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 blah. but what if somebody reading it and says like, okay, how do you prove it? Every line that goes into your petition has to have, how do you prove it? Like what's the backup? So um, another another advice from one of the colleagues who has an immigration consultancy now gave me, stop using a lot of adverbs. Like what, when you work with your petition, use a lot of evidences. Do not say, oh, I'm extraordinary and this, 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 this. This might be very useful in the last, towards the last of it, Coming back to EB1B, if you're a PhD or a postdoc in this session, if you're coming from STEM, try to target authors because you can have papers. You can use your papers. Even if you're, one of your paper is not cited a lot, but if you think it's of great work, it, it was funded by a bigger group. It came from your postdoc or PhD or is part of one of the national importance agencies. Try to highlight that that this agency funded our world, we did this, and this is important for your uh, for nation's importance. You might hear this in terms of NIW a lot, that that is what nation's importance uh, uh, petition is. But in my sense, and maybe that's very little, but it says that if you're worried, it's showing that it's important for nation, it's going to have a lot more easier time with USCIS officer. If, you're, if your petition is saying, hey, I'm a, a finance um, ML guy, there are like thousands of them in US. US is loading on them. If your work says, hey, I work in biomedical and we invented this, this is important. Everything that seems important or is important for US is going to make your petition a lot better. So if you work in the fields like biomedical, energy, green tech, AI, ML, computers, things like these, you, you have slightly easier chance. Try to use it for your um, benefit and try to talk about that. Hey, I'm working on this technology. I'm extraordinary. And if this if this petition goes, if I become this or something like that, we're going to advance this even further, right? If your petition looks promising, you're a scientist, you're you're an engineer coming up with this field and you're gonna do this much, it, it's going to have a lot easier time. So that is with authors. The other is original contribution where EB1B folks tend to get a lot of RFP because most EB1Bs do authors, judging, and original contribution, largely, I would say. So authors and um, 
authors and judging go a lot easier if you have good, got good papers, good citation and judging. Original contribution tends to have RFA because what you think is an original contribution to US or to worldwide might not be that original, might not be of that significance for them. So one of the things that I, my, I tapped on it, all the letters that you take, letters specifically which are talking about your original contribution that you specifically did a patent, you did a work um, that, that is a part of US government or that is a part of anything important. Try to have in your letters, these keywords like like for example uh dr shukla did uh, innovated this model which is a part of us epa with the major significance this has been innovated for the first time in history and this would become a backbone of these many upcoming models or these many studies and this is gonna you know create a levy there it has to mention in your letter that this is done for the first time that is the USCIS officer probably has studied uh, uh, STEM on generic or is trained in STEM on generic. He does not know what I do in climate tech or air quality or biomedical or even the medicines that you're working at. But the, um, uh, and, and because I was an internet savvy, I was just reading everything on internet, all good and bad advice. One of the Twitter links that I found, if you think your petition is not that strong, if you think you have less citation, your original contribution is not that huge, but you, if you think I can still make it Try to have recommendation letters that are very strong. That, that's what I said. Do not have, it, it's not a recommendation that letter that you're taking for a job or for you know, a PhD admission or a postdoc admission. It's going to USCIS, have it written very specifically. Get it read. And if your lawyers are offering, we'll write it, but be, be very wary. That's not gonna go really well. They're gonna you know, do a factory machine outlet where they're gonna copy paste some models and they're gonna give you a letter, try to have a letter that uh, kind of uh, showcases your work, details of it. Try to, if if you're trying to do, uh, say, uh, original contribution, try to say it's um, it's done for the first time. It has to evidently say that. It has to say that this is coming for the first time, this is gonna create this, this, this. this. Also, um, one of the very, very good advice that you can get through internet, have your recommendation letters divided in certain people. Some folks that, that you know, some folks that you might know, but on papers, you should not know, or it's good that if, even if you don't know them at all, somebody who cited your work sitting in Europe, did, so that's how I, I did. I did a total of nine recommendation letters. I went overboard with everything. So I was that kind of uh, crazy person with this. Um, uh, somebody, so what was happening with me? I had six letters. I had about four from the known folks, two from the uh, folks that I didn't know. And somebody I made and this is like, you know what? There should be a balance. You should have same number of recommendation letters from the people who, who do not know you directly and same with the people or at least less from the people who know you. And I was like, what should I do? Should I just take two out and submit with four? But mm, being my brain of abundance, I got three more letters from people who did not know me and I submitted eventually with nine. How, did you, how do you get the letters? One of the key takeaways. Go with your papers, look at who cited them. Okay, so I'm so sorry. I'm going to interrupt right here okay. because someone has asked a question about how you get the letters. So maybe we can have time for the Q&A and then you can answer some of the questions that they may be asking um, uh, in the chat. Because I feel like some of what you're talking about, some people have asked questions about. So I just want to give people time to kind of talk, ask, ask you questions so you can share a little bit more. So I'm so sorry yeah. to Okay, so I will pass it on to Aditi and then we'll have like time for a few questions in the next few minutes that we have. Oh, sure. Um, thank you. I, I know we, we are just 15 minutes away from 1 p.m. Uh, we can go five minutes overboard. Komal and Arya, are you okay with that? Because we started at 12.05. So I want to make sure that folks get everything that you wanted to share, Komal, including the parts that you have left. And we can sandwich them into the Q&A part. Is that cool? We just go from 1 p.m. to 1.05. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so, everything's good. I, I think we can just take the questions. That, that'll be okay. much more helpful. Um, I, really quickly, before we get into the Q&A, uh, I know uh, Na is going to mention this as well, but I'll mention it uh, already. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and raise your hands, and Na is going to go through the list uh, one by one. But before that, uh, these events are not just to let you know how to qualify for EB1, how to get a green card. The goal of getting a green card is to get as much flexibility as you can possibly get 
within the US to work on what you came here to work for, that is get a better life. And there are multiple ways to go about it. It's not just EB1, it's not just this one path, that one path. Uh, and for you to get to know that another alternate path for you to expand your ambitions in the US. We have an event coming up, not next Saturday, but the Saturday after with this gentleman whose email LinkedIn um, link I've provided in the chat. His name is Mark Pavlopoulos, and he is the CEO of Syndesis. The entire spiel of Syndesis is if your H-1B has expired or some in, in some way your immigration status has been ruptured in the U.S., the next option is to not pack your bags and go to India. There is also an option where you can pursue the same career that you have in the U.S. from Canada. So they are the ones who sit between uh, immigration, they sit between HR uh, and, and you. So if you want to know that option, which is available to you, I would highly encourage you to come not next Saturday, but the Saturday after. And somebody said, how do we network? Well, this is where you start. Everybody over here, there are 29 of us here. Uh, if folks can get into this uh, Excel sheet that I have created to put in their LinkedIn's, go ahead and add each other and see if there are ways that you can collaborate so that uh, you're not just building your profile yourself, you're building it with somebody else and uh, it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, that's the that's a start for the networking. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Dadu for the Q&A. Thank you, thank you. So we'll just start off, I'm seeing some questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll start off with those and then I'll, I see the, your hands up, so I'll come to you for sure. Um, so this is an easy one. Um, Aya, what visa status were you on? after your OPT and before applying or getting EB1 um, B approval. Got it, yeah, so I was on H1B visa and then, um, so I was working on my EB1 B petition on my H1B visa. Okay, thank you. Next question in the chat, um, what's the best avenue to get an invited for peer reviewing papers? Either of you can take this. Yeah, so peer reviewing is really, um, you have to, I think uh, Como mentioned this, you want to, people talk to me a lot about increasing your peer reviews, like do more and that helps. Yes, that's true. But also you want to focus on quality over quantity. So you can look at Google Scholar and you can look at what are the top journals in your specific field. And you can say, hey, in Google Scholar, this cancer journal is, you know, top 10. And I have peer reviewed for this specific journal. And hence, I am internationally outstanding, or hence, I am, you know, uh, um, hence, I have the qualifications to peer review, like, why would they invite me, right? So you have to show that the journal is top. And uh, to get the peer reviews is definitely challenging, you have to do a lot of emails, you have to do a lot of networking, um, you have to do a lot of digging. I would say go on LinkedIn, try to message the editors on LinkedIn. If that doesn't work, try to see if your friends have peer reviewed for that journal, ask them to refer you. Um, those would be my top points. Yeah. Thank you. Hamla, do you have anything or shall we move on? Yeah, I just see a question. How do you reach out to people you didn't know for recommendation letters? Um, I think uh, one of the best ways that look at the look at your paper, look at who have cited in Google Scholar, list all the first, second, third authors, try to look at them on Google. Most of them would be working at Academical Research Institute. They would have their email in public domain. Email them the same email. Hey, hi, this is my work. It got published. I see you've cited. It's great. I would want to read more of your work. I was working on this. Uh, uh, we don't probably need to give them too much in the beginning to scare them off. Just tell them that, hey, I'm working for this thing uh, for upgradation in my career. I say you're a very renowned scientist and this will help me if you can just put in a word in my um, you know, writing document that how my work helped you. I can also give you a draft if you would want and you can see and work on that. And if you send it to say 20 people who you do not know who have uh, cited your paper, some of them would be kind enough to reply. Thank you. Um, so Neil, so you have a question in the chat. So I don't know if you want to uh, unmute and ask the question. If it's a different question, feel free to ask that as well. 
Sure, thanks. Uh, so I have a question, uh, the same one in the chat. So does the editorial membership in the journal, it, does it qualify as a membership for criteria for the EB1A? Being yeah. a member of the editorial board of the journal. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. it, 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 it well. goes really well if you're um, putting for the criteria judging. If you're a journalist, uh, reviewer, editor, or one of those board members, it holds a lot more value or significant value similar to, you know, reviewing 10, 15 papers. If you're reviewed and if you're a uh, reviewing editor or anything else in editorial board, it, it's really helpful. So, so, Kumal, so I think he was asking about the membership criteria. Like, does it fulfill? And I think it, it fulfill them? I think it does not, but I don't think it does. Like, so, like just being a member? No, no, no like, uh, the criteria of being a member of uh, an association, the membership criteria. Uh, in the EB1A. So, oh, for the membership criteria, uh, it's yeah. very clear. Unless it's a very prestigious thing where you're invited to be a member of it, then it mm -hmm. matters. If you can um, freely apply to it, pay for it, uh, volunteer it, or anything like that, it doesn't. It has to be something very prestigious like EBA, AMA, who invited you for your work and you became part of it. And also, uh, another um, criteria that tends to get a lot of RFE if you're not part of a um, membership group, which is not very highly repeatable. In the yeah. so, so my question is specific to the uh, being a med, uh, editorial board in the journal, member of an editorial board. So is that um, thing qualify as a membership criteria? No. Because it's something prestigious. It's difficult to be, and I cannot just pay and be a in the editorial board of, of a journal. So you can use that particular one in judging as that you are a board member of reviewers, whether you are a junior reviewer or anybody up ladder in the senior, but you cannot use it as the membership membership criteria because it is not an association that is meant for expert in the fields like medical association or something. It is for a journal. It, it is similar like being a faculty in a, a redeemed university, you can say that it's significant as you're judging multiple papers or something, but you're not a member of an invited association in that case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. I agree with Komal on that. And the membership criteria, from my understanding, just as Komal mentioned, is extremely hard criteria to fulfill. So my lawyers asked me to not do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's go to Sundeepa. You have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, Aditi, first of all, thank you for doing this. And Arya and Komal, you did a wonderful job. Congratulations to both of you. So, so first, my question is, when is the right time to apply for it? So when do we know that it's the right time? So uh, coming to my profile, I just came here a year back. So I did my bachelor's in India and I came here for my uh, master's and I finished it in one in two semesters from Cornell University and I started working three months back. So I don't have any citations to be honest. I'm so much into communities, tech and uh, like hackathons and stuff. I think I now have three evidences that I can prove. But I don't think it's the right time because it's just been one year and my company is willing to sponsor me H1B. So what do you think? Uh, do you think I should apply for it like in a few months or uh, wait for another one year and try to build my profile? And again, uh, um, th that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. What, when do we know that it's the right time to apply? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that's that every every applicant is going to kind of think about that question at some point, even I did, like, you know, how long should I wait? And I think you have to kind of, you're the best judge, I would say for that. Um, it's, it's not going to be a straightforward answer. And I think the more you'll have more confidence when you talk to people and when you decide which criteria you're going to go for and mm -hmm. how strong is your, how strong is your evidence for each criteria? The more people you talk to, the more you'll kind of understand like, oh, is, I can make this stronger or I can, you know, and I would ask other people to review your profile and yeah. kind of get their opinion. So I would say like the best way to do is just talk to your friends, have them judge your profile. And sometimes citation is not the only thing. Like I 
what I did is I talked to a lot of people with low citations, like people with 50 citations who got approved and they got a letter from their state governor or something like that. So there are ways, there are creative ways you can do, even if you have low citations, you can get really creative. And that's what I want to tell everyone. Like, even if you think your profiles aren't ready today, mm -hmm. the time, it takes about nine months for, it took nine months for me to build my profile. Actually more than that, I was working on it for more than nine months because nine months for my first application, another nine months for my second application, right? So 18 months. Yeah, yeah. Months. So when I first started, my citation was only 50, five zero. And then once I got my successful approved, it was like closer to 150. So I would say start building your profile and then talk to people and then you will get an idea when you're going to be ready. And then also another thing I tell people is if cost is not a factor to you, go ahead and apply because then the comments that you get back from the officer is going to help you make your profile better because it helped me. But cost is going to be an important factor there. Like I'm going to spend this money, you know, but the comments that I got back helped me build my profile. So that's what I would say. Yeah, wonderful. Thank another, you. Another question mm -hmm. about that, Arya, which Sudhiba is not asking, which other folks might have is if you get a denial the first time, how does that impact the second time you apply? It does not. It has no impact on the on the second time you apply. It goes to most, usually it goes to a, a new officer, unless you're really, really unlucky. That's highly, like highly unlikely that you would get the same officer. But usually you get a new officer. And again, you know, you send a lot of prayers saying that, okay, I hope this goes to a new officer. And then the officer is in a good mood and then he uh, approves it. So yeah, even if you get a denial, I know people who applied Three times got denied, the fourth time it got approved. So even the number of times you can try, it doesn't matter. You can keep trying. And as you keep trying, your your citations are gonna build up right automatically. So yeah, even if it's get denied, don't worry about it. You can always reapply. And it's always looked at as a fresh application. Okay. So so Don and um Apova. Uh, they have questions about citations, um, so I thought we could just combine them. The first one is, do citations only count for first author papers? And related to that, do citations only count for data papers versus review papers? Um, I think citations count for everything. Everything that's gotten published doesn't even have to ha be a published paper. It could be a magazine, a news article, literally anything that's out in press, out in public, could be a one page or whatever. If it's cited, like uh, some might have noticed some of your papers are um, sometimes cited by newspaper and magazines. Everything is everything's a citation if it's out in public, has been written by, uh, sourced by a acknowledgeable source. Yeah, and I add here that my my highest citation paper I was the 13th author one three um, but what I did was I got letters from the first and last author saying Aria mm -hmm. did a lot of work and she did x y and z like be very specific Aria did x y and z um, for this specific thing so that's why even you know that's why like she did a lot of work so even if you are the 13th author and it's the highest citation if you get letters that does help to show that you know you did um, yeah like, like she said uh creativity you you see what you're seeing try to show them what you want to show uh you you could have one of your greatest paper that only got five citation because it got published last year mm -hmm. but that's your biggest work how do you how do you say five is a big number you don't talk about five you talk about the work you take a letter from somebody saying that like she said that she did a very significant work in this paper. Pick from the angle where it, it is strongest. Try to focus on that. And th this this is just going to be helpful. Great. Um, Ami, do you want to ask your question? You have your hand up. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for this uh, information session. I had a question about uh, uh, the recommendation letters that Komal was talking about. Like, what specific uh, the uh, things are they looking in the recommendation letter that needs to be discussed uh, about the impact of your work? If you could elaborate on that. So, Amy, could you, could you specify your question? What in the recommendation letter needs to be highlighted? Yes, yes. So it depends. For example, um, it's very simple. If you're 